Yes. Den. Den jag vet inte hur den funkar. Okej, okay. den måste... Okay, a warm welcome to you in the audience here today and also to you who are watching this online. My name is Cecilia Jedet. I work as an innovation developer at LU Innovation, the central innovation support unit at Lund University. It's our job to help researchers and students at Lund University with ideas that could become useful uh, to the society, which could become a product, a method or a service. And with me here today on stage, I have Thomas Rundqvist, head of office for LU Innovation. Yeah. yeah, we sure have a great job where we see a lot of innovative ideas. And um, yeah, this place, Lund, Univers Lund University, one of the top 100 universities in the world, is of course a great source for knowledge. Yes, and we at L Innovation has arranged this exciting event today with the aim to inspire more women in science to take ideas beyond academia. We need to make the most of our innovative power to be able to meet the challenges of today and the future. And we are part of a system that has been unequal for a long time. But to not be part of the problems ourselves, we have to discuss, learn and to act upon it. And that's what we war want to do today. Yeah. So today we hope to shed some light, provoke some thoughts and um, of course to inspire. And uh, we are ex excited and happy to have uh, today Anna Branten, who is very experienced in this field, as uh, today's moderator. So I have hand over to you, Anna, and uh, let the show begin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Branten and I am very happy to be here today to discuss this favorite topic of mine. Uh, changing the world, uh, can we actually do that on a major scale if we get better at addressing the fact that our views on gender are stopping us? Uh, this is what we will try to figure out during this afternoon together. So. Um, the world is changing, and it is changing fast. Uh, never before have we had to tackle so many complex challenges, and at the same time we seem to be moving further and further apart from each other in our societies. We see polarities in pol politics, in social media, uh, between people and within companies, shaped by who we are, our different experiences, ideologies, fears and knowledge, or lack thereof. And while these enormous challenges are facing us as a society, new perspectives are emerging and how to solve, uh, on how to solve our problems and now when reading or listening to debates regarding, for example, the climate change, it is like we are actually living in two parallel worlds. Uh, we do still live in a market economy, and in one hand, we have a paradigm telling us that uh, we know how the market economy works. We are used to doing things and run businesses in a very specific way. And when we start working at a company, for example, we can almost be certain that we know how it works. We know what a boss is, how to measure success, uh, that you are there to make profit to your shareholders, uh, you know how to sell, interact with each other, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, uh, we have a very strong movement, a kind of an uprising, actually, of people who see the need of doing things differently who want to challenge the status quo, and they are developing new kinds of economic models that are being put to place, like donut, donut economy, for example, in Amsterdam, or purpose economy that is used in uh, building companies. And they want to create new types of cities and new types of businesses, and are actually uh, creating new narratives but at the same time, they also have to have one foot in the other world in order to be able to communicate and get access to the people in power, for example. So if we just take a few minutes and look a little bit closer uh, at these two different worlds. So we have the question of growth. 
on a national level and in companies. We are used to measure what we do in figures, um, where we have uh, sometimes excluded the nature and resources needed to deliver growth, an attitude that we know have put people and planet at risk. And therefore, on the other hand, we see those who are more planet oriented They feel that we are in this for survival now, actually, for our planet and for humanity, and they believe whatever we do from now must address that first. Growth, sure, but not at the expense of surviving. So here you can see a conflict almost everywhere. The growth people think that the planet ones are up in the clouds and are not realistic, and the planet people think that the growth people are greedy and stuck in old beliefs. And it continues. Uh, some politicians and business leaders tend to look at future solutions from a tech perspective that tech innovations are going to solve most of our challenges. Others think that we need to address society as a whole now and prioritize the well-being of people and nature. Some are still product oriented and think that consumerism is still important to drive wealth, uh, while some are more orientated around circularity and sharing economies, providing services, reusing and repairing. And I would also say that the absolute majority of companies are still orientated around making profit for shareholders. And the thought that the point of building businesses are mainly to make money. Others are driven by purpose and trying to find how they can make uh, the most for everyone. Here also, uh, I see conflicts in every aspect of making decision in a, for a company, for example. How do you prioritize in new ways in a company that still needs to make profit, while at the same time the nature is suffering from the things that you do? Uh, some are in a business mode that taught them the game of survival of the fittest, and that it's important to be secretive, win market shares, make profit, and build whatever they can within uh, the companies whereas others are trying to co-create, share wealth, build new alliances and see transparency as something, as something extremely important. Some need to plan, analyze, having a clear overview and rely on statistics for making decisions and moving forward, whereas others have realized that in an ever-changing, complex world, you are going to need to rely on your collective intuition to be able to move faster, be flexible and resilient. Which leads me to the last bit. Some are more comfortable to surround themselves by people that look like themselves, that they can understand and that validates their views on the world, where others have realized that you need a variety of people, experiences and skills to be able to understand the complex needs of customers and the ever changing world. So, what has this to do with gender? Well, in many ways actually, because our current system is very much built around rationality, measurements, logic, competition, power, being fast and forceful, qualities that we tend to characterize as male. Whereas we tend to think about mother nature, nurturing, caring and sharing as female. I mean, there must be a reason why, why uh, the vast majority of HR bosses are female, right? So, what is the future of innovation then? And the future of business? Well, research say that instead of the product innovations we are used to see come out of the tech universities, for example, we need to focus on system innovation, norm innovation and process innovation. Innovations that can move fast through different industries and have a potential to transform our societies. And with that said, we also need to start looking at not at what entrepreneurship is and sort of teach out the, the skill of being an entrepreneur, but um, and we need to focus on what it can be, actually, in the future instead. Uh, so I firmly believe that we, for example, 
um, we need innovations from other faculties than the ones that we are used to seeing. So how do we release that potential then? And is there a wrong or a right way here? No. I think that here is where we need to build bridges between the ways we are used to see the business with the new ways of doing things. And we need both perspectives and we need to find ways to include everyone in this. And we all need to try to have an open mind about that, however difficult that might be. Uh, because we are in this uh, together. And since a lot of women are feeling that they have been shut out of the current system and that the system does not work for them, they kind of already have an outside view on how they would like things to work uh, for themselves and for the greater good. So for me, the perspective of gender is an excellent way to start to discuss this and try to inspire as many women as possible to start and accelerate their companies in order to drive the change that we need to see. So this is actually a call out to all thinkers and all innovators to take their ideas to the next step, whatever the step might be and in whatever form you want to participate. It is time to reinvent innovation. Uh, and another very good perspective when you are trying to understand what is happening and to move forward is to look at what's, what history can teach us. And someone who has done a tremendous job looking at innovation from a female point of view is Catherine Marsal, uh, best-selling author of the book Mother of Invention. Welcome, Catherine. Hi. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> happy to see you. Happy to have you happy here. Happy to see you too. I am so happy to see you because I don't know if you know this, Anna, but I'm actually born and raised in Lund. You are. So even though, yeah, so even though I'm tuning in from uh, my home, which is in the UK at the moment, the room that I can see that you're all sitting in um, right now on my screen is a room that's very familiar to me. So it's, ah, yeah, it's great. Nice to hear. So I'm going to ask you to fire away and uh, talk us through your discoveries when writing your book. And then afterwards, we are going to have a little uh, conversation. OK? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so uh, my book is called Mother of Invention, How Good Ideas Get Ignored in an Economy Built for Men. This is the Canadian edition. Um, I'm happy to have had it um, published in quite a few uh, countries. Um, and it's a book about women and innovation and how women have been excluded from innovation. And basically, I say two things. I first talk about how you know, women are excluded from innovation. And secondly, how things that we perceive as feminine are also looked down upon as inferior and not as technical, perhaps, as many things that we perceive as, as male. And the book, sorry, the book starts with this classic mystery of innovation that many economists and management thinkers on innovation have thought about, which is that in spite of the fact that we invented the wheel 5,000 years ago, we didn't put wheels on suitcases until 1972. This is one of the stories you often hear about innovation. You know, how come that we had this technology of the wheel, we put it on bikes and cars, and we made ferries wheels and hamster wheels, but nobody thought to put it on suitcases until 1972. So that's three years after we managed to put two men on the face of the moon and the same year that we drove a vehicle with wheels on the surface of the moon. It doesn't make sense, which is why it's become this classic mystery of innovation. How come that even the baggage carousel was invented before the suitcase with wheels? Um, and there's been many theories about this. I present a <laughs> new one in the beginning of my book, um, which is that the missing key to solving this mystery of innovation actually is gender because there were products applying the technology of the wheel to the problem of the rolling suit of the suitcase well before 1972 actually 
But they were all, or most of them, were these niche products for women. They never took off. They were never properly invested in. Nobody really saw the potential. And clearly nobody saw that this little idea, let's put wheels on suitcases, was something that would go on and completely disrupt the whole global luggage industry and change you know, how, we, how we travel, how we build airports and airplanes. These were niche products for women because there was this very, very fundamental idea that no man would ever roll a suitcase. Um, women might do it, but women were too small of a market. No man would ever roll a suitcase because it's simply unmanly. A real man has to carry his bag. Um, women might roll a suitcase, um, uh, the idea was, but women are too small of a market because if a woman travels, she normally does it with a man who then has to carry her suitcase for her. Which is why it took a very, very long time for this idea to to sort of become reality. And even in the 1970s, when the rolling suitcase was officially invented, at first, no American department store wanted to sell it um, because they just didn't think it was, it was viable. Men would never, never accept this thing. And then, of course, it changed. And what I argue in the book, that this was connected to sort of larger changes on the labor market in the 1980s and women rising in corporate, women, women getting out onto the um, formal labor market, women going on business trips to a larger extent. And they adopted this product and then the men followed. And today, obviously, a rolling suitcase is... Um, is completely normal. It's even expected for almost every male businessman to be rolling one of these cabin luggage bags behind him. We've completely forgotten about, forgotten about this really gendered history of resistance to this product. And I chose to start my book, Mother of Invention, here because I think it's, well, A, it's a funny story. It's quite funny that this problem, why didn't we get wheels on suitcases until 1972? The solution actually has to do with gender, but it's also the fact that it's, it's a concrete product that most of us have a relationship to. And by telling this story, hopefully it's possible to communicate to the reader that gender is something that affects innovation that an idea about you know, what is a real man, what is a real woman, you know, how do we travel, how do we behave based on gender is something that can hold back technological innovation. Um, and, and that's an important point to make, I think, because very often we talk about innovation and the forces of technology as these neutral forces just pushing the economy and pushing society and pushing everybody along. And that's, um, uh, and that's not true. They are shaped by humans. They are shaped by us. We, um, and we come into the creation of machines, the funding of machines, the innovation of new technologies shaped by all of our ideas and biases. And among them, gender is a quite significant one. So that's where the book starts. Uh, but there are other examples and I'm gonna just briefly give you two of them because I know Anna is keen to ask me some questions, I think, um, of how sort of innovation affects or gender affects innovation and then hopefully come to some kind of conclusion. So the second important example from the book has to do with electric cars, which is of course something we talk about a lot at the moment. But what uh, many of you know, of course, is that electric cars have quite a long history. They were around already in the late 1800s at the dawn of the automobile era. Uh, here in London, where I live, I live outside of London, you could phone up an electric taxi company at the end of the 1800s and they would come and pick you up. What's interesting 
uh, about this from my perspective is how electric cars were largely marketed to women. Um, at this time, there was this idea that if a car was more comfortable, more quiet, uh, cleaner, like the electric car was, then it was suitable for women. Um, and the electric car industry marketed their product in this way towards wealthy women. And the electric car was product developed largely with women in mind. Electric cars were the first cars to be created with roofs. They were created so you could drive them in a skirt um, and, and so on. But what then happened was that these associations between electric car technology and women pretty soon became a commercial problem for the electric car industry, particularly in the US. Because if something is branded female, we very often also see it as inferior in a way. So if this was a ladies car, many male consumers didn't want it. And by sort of 1916, you can read executives from the electric car industry complaining about how their beautiful high-tech product has been branded as a car for the elderly, the women, and the infirm, end of quote. And this, so this was a way that it actually held back the size of the electric car market at the time which wasn't the main reason, gender wasn't the main reason to why sort of electric cars disappeared and we ended up building a whole world for petrol driven technology. You know, the battery problems of electric car technology at the time were probably more or were more significant as a factor, but gender was still there. Automobile historians often talk about the other cultural factors that contributed to the demise of the electric car. And I argue in the book that you should call those other cultural factors what they are, which is sexism, really. Um, and it's interesting that gender, again, here in this sort of massive technological choice that we made at the time, let's build a whole world for petrol driven technology, gender was a factor in that mix which shows you how you know, important these biases actually can be and how they can delay innovation, as in the case of the rolling suitcase, and also profoundly shape innovation as you know, they did when it came to electric car technology. So those are sort of two hopefully concrete stories from history about that. And I, I now want to make probably a more general point about innovation and women and how we write the history of technology that I also make in the book. And that has to do with the fact that our definition of technology has so often followed our definition of masculinity in the economy. So when we look back at the history of innovation, it can easily seem as if everything great ever has been invented by a man. And that's something that, you know, I for one has, have often heard when I, you know, I travel around um, internationally and, and speak about these issues, or at least I did before the pandemic hit. Um, and often talking to investors and, you know, showing them things like, you know, men get 99% of all venture capital in Sweden. The numbers for, for the UK are very similar. Isn't this a problem? And people will come up to me afterwards and say, yes, I see, I see your figures, but, you know, there are historical explanations to that. You know, if you look at the history of innovation, most things have been invented by men. Women are just now catching up. I'm an investor, you know, I have to invest in sort of what has a future here and now. And maybe in a hundred years, there will be more, more women innovating and then, then I can invest in that. But right now, men simply have better ideas. That is something that you do hear a lot. And I think it is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the history of innovation. Um, were things that women, technologies created by women, we tend to not see as technology. 
So I have one example of in the book, which is the, the moon suit that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin wore to the moon, which ended up being created by a company specialized in bra making because the technology of sewing was literally the only thing that could solve this very, very complex problem. What kind of clothing can protect the human body in space? Um, and the solution ended up coming from that area of technology, sewing and soft materials, which we don't tend to view as technology in the same way as things made from, for example, hard materials. And this makes us misunderstand the history of, of innovation. Um, we talk about the Stone Age, the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Uh, why don't we talk about, for example, the String Age? So string is an innovation, you know, they believe was done by women. And you could argue that, for example, string is a is a more, more fundamental innovation than tools made from stone. You know, imagine if you have string, you can make fishing nets, you can bind things together using a rope. But no, we don't talk about the string age. We don't talk about the ceramic age, even though obviously, you know, ceramic is a, was a tremendously important innovation and everything around that largely developed by women throughout history, not only, but that doesn't get to define a whole era in the same way that bronze or iron does. And the same with, you know, we don't talk about the flax age or the weaving age, you know, those forms of technologies, again, associated with women are not viewed as innovation or technology in the same way. And I think at the back of our minds, there is definitely this narrative of how innovation happens that goes something like this, that sometime way back um, in history, when we were walking around on all fours being hairy apes, somebody got up, got a sharp stick somewhere, sharpened it into a spear, and that was the first innovation, the first form of technology the first tool. Uh, and everything else basically is some kind of extension of that first spear invented probably by a man. That is in a way how we still think about innovation. If you go to an average startup conference, they will talk about innovation largely like that. Because what this story does, you know, this belief that the first tool was a stick uh, sharpened into a spear, spear by a man and everything else is an extension of that does is that it ties our will to innovate, our will to create technology inevitably to some kind of will to conquer and dominate the world around us. And that's if you think about it, still how we talk about innovation. It's all about disrupting and crushing, dominating, move fast and break things. That's the primary narrative around it. And that's why it's so important, I believe, to sort of include women back into this history. And I try to do my bit in, in my book because suddenly the meaning of it changes. You know, so we have no idea what the first tool was, but it could as well have been, you know, a digging stick, which is, you know, an innovation uh, thought to have been invented by women, although we're not sure. Uh, just as likely as it was a spear. And imagine if the first tool or the narrative we had about innovation was that it all started with a woman inventing, you know, a digging stick instead, then innovation is not in the same way inevitably tied to some kind of will to conquer and dominate the world around us. It's not just disrupt, crush and dominate. And it opens innovation up to being able to become so much more. It can be about repairing, healing, cooperating, all things that we've sort of excluded from that discussion because we, for you know, false reasons, think of them as feminine, which we you know which they're not. If anything, they're human. And so those are sort of the big main points in this book. You know, innovation is shaped by us. We come into that with all of our biases. Gender bias has, you know, delayed 
innovations we now take for granted, sometimes for hundreds of years. We have this insistence on insisting that um, almost everything that women have invented historically is not technology, is not innovation, which creates a narrative of innovation that when women today are studying it or looking at it, they are basically studying their own absence, which doesn't particularly make women, uh, encourages women to stand up and say, I have an idea, I'm an innovator. And that's why I think it's very, very important to try to reshape this narrative. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Catherine. Um, I, when I read the book, which was uh, a revelation for me, actually, it was uh, a great experience. I, uh, I, I was stuck on a couple of other uh, things that you are talking about. One is um, the opposition that innovation often meets uh, from the system. Uh, you're talking about building, um, uh, building roads in ancient Rome. Can you talk about a little bit about that? Um, yes. Well, I mean, so that's about the that we tend to think of innovation as somebody has a has a great idea and then suddenly everything changes. And obviously, the most classic example of that is is the wheel. You know, the way that's portrayed in cartoons and things is like somebody comes up with this amazing idea of of the wheel and suddenly nothing is is the same anymore. Everything is literally rolling. But, you know, the point that many historians of innovation have made is that, you know, for the wheel to actually work, you need so many other things, you know, like roads that, that uh, are strong enough um, to sort of uh, withstand transport on wheels, uh, which they didn't do largely in the, in the Roman period. Um, and it wasn't in, until sort of that technology of road building had developed and we had sort of systems in place for regulating roads and dealing with who should maintain roads and who should, um, you know, remove the stone in whose responsibility is it to remove the snow in winter and, and all of these other things had to be in place, you know, social innovation, institutional innovation for the wheel to be able to reach its full potential and actually change the world. I am guess that's the point you're after, Anna. Yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> when you were writing this book, uh, were you surprised when you did your research? Did you have your own revelations during your writing journey? Yes, all the time. Um, it is, um, I mean, first, it's, it's always shocking how, you know, as a journalist, which is my profession, you tend to come to things, you know, you're a storyteller, you put things together and you're hopefully skilled at sort of telling these stories in a way that they can sort of reach and interest a wider audience. Um, but when you're sort of dealing with women and innovation in particular, there is, it's like there's, there's just so little research, you know. For example, I have, I have a, a, a chapter on the book that deals a lot with um, a, a great um, Swedish innovation, which is the, the wheeled walker, uh, which was um, invented by a, a woman from, from Skåne originally, actually, but who was then living in, in Västerås, um, called Aina Vifalk. Uh, and this is clearly an, an innovation that has changed um, life for you know, millions of particularly elderly people around the world. Swedish innovation which is very, very strange. And so I was trying to tell this story in the book about this woman, Aina Vifalk, and there was just, you know, normally when you're a journalist coming to these things, there's, there's always a dissertation or two or three that you can, you know, read and, and pull your things from, but there really wasn't. Um, and I had to kind of, you know, go into some type of, you know, uh, you know really basic research and um, that just wasn't done on her. Uh, which should have been done on her, obviously. So these things were were shocking to me almost almost all the time. Just how, you know, how how we just don't don't talk about these these things enough, which again creates this 
this idea that you know the history of technology and innovation is is this really male thing that women women have only recently been sort of allowed to have something to do with mm. um i know also that you have received great response for your book you have done tons of interviews and you have also done some workshops with uh, companies and so i wonder what are the most common questions that you get what seems to be on people's minds um well i think for for businesses there's often this this problem of you know we are trying we want people to come forward with great ideas obviously then we ask people to come forward with great ideas to you know an internal incubator or whatever it can be and only men apply um and you know we know that's you know that's not right and that's not good but you know why why is is that the case um and that and that is a a phenomenon clearly and and i saw it also in sort of you know looking at at the history aspect of it that that it seems very very uh, difficult for women to kind of claim the um identity of i'm an innovator i'm an even i'm an entrepreneur and even if you look at you know somebody somebody like just to go with with swedish you know great inventors like like laila olgren who was you know uh, absolutely fund her idea was like absolutely fundamental to develop mobile phone technology even somebody like her who you know basically invented modern mobile phone technology never really saw herself as an innovator uh, you know if you if you read interviews with her or or talk to people um and you kind of think if if not e- not even a woman who invented mobile phone technology can come out and say or feels that she can come out and say i'm an innovator that shows you how sort of big of a gap there really is between women and taking on that identity and that's clearly something that businesses do struggle with and you know some of the ones i've been talking to they found that you know a lot of it has to do with how you ask the question um you know if you instead ask people you know we have this problem that we think you can help us solve it then more women um seem to come forward and you know there's different way of of trying to be more more inclusive but i think this this is definitely something that that many people people recognize um and then i mean i've also been talking a lot to to you know a couple of um IT companies and and they you know clearly struggle with this mystery that I also talk about in the book which is that you know how come that you know women basically invented software and uh, a couple of decades later computer science seems to be the field that it's the hardest to to get women women into um and uh, and it's it's interesting very much so um i'm also curious if you now that, now that you have met uh, your readers so to say um if you were to make an additional chapter right now including the things that you have learned during the different discussions you've had since you released your book what would that chapter be about oh um so it's not i mean it's it's certainly come out in sweden i've had lots of you know great great feedback uh from from swedish readers and um and particularly from you know many many engineers in in sweden have really seemed to have have liked the book you know i i write you know about i'm a, i guess i'm you could call me a financial journalist so i i write you know primarily on on economics and the economic perspective on these things but but i've had um so i wasn't expecting all of this positive feedback particularly from from the engineering community internationally the book i mean it only came out in the in the us and canada a few days ago so i haven't had that much international feedback yet it's, it's coming out in in france and and in germany next year but i think the book ends with the whole challenge of of sustainability and you know how that is something that also tied into a lot of sort of ideas around gender and um and you know as as you were touching upon Anna as well you know mother earth and sort of the masculine forces of technology and 
things like, you know, oh, a real man has to eat a certain amount of meat or drive a certain car, you know, these notions of gender are certainly very present there. And um, I think if I had to sort of um, write another chapter, that would probably be sort of uh, more on that theme because I've certainly, I think, developed my, my thinking uh, and my understanding around those challenges uh, more uh, from the feedback I've gotten and, um, and the discussions I've, I've had with people. Hmm. So now we are actually moving a little bit into the future here. And uh, there we have a question from a female entrepreneur who is going to be in the panel later on. Uh, and she was both sad and happy when she read the, your book. Uh, and her question to you is, uh, what do we do with all this new knowledge that you provide for us? <laughs> How can this uh, turn into action? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I mean, so I do, I mean, I do have thoughts on, for example, the financial innovation needed um, because I think, and I mean, this might, this is you know, quite a radical, I guess, uh, conclusion, not everyone agrees, but, you know, I do have a chapter on venture capital in particular, where I do um, argue that it is uh, because the way it's set up with fee structures and, um, and the type of businesses it's then and ideas it's then looking for because of how it's structured, it is very, very badly suited for capturing women's ideas and innovation. And that would be fine unless this type of funding has become so dominant in the last, you know, 15 years. Um, so I do believe that, and I argue for this in the book, that, you know, if we, if we recognize this problem that, you know, if, say, venture capital is very dominant, 99% of all venture capital in Sweden goes to men, you know, that sets us up for a future where, you know, the many of the business models and the technologies that will define life for all of us are exclusively created by men that might not be such a good thing. In that case, what we do need is, you know, not, you know, more um, advice to women about how to pitch, although that can be useful as well. But we need different types of funding based on different uh, types of logic. Uh, and there is innovation going on in that space. But I do think sort of really looking at the financial system and why the money all end up <laughs> where they end up is is quite important so that is definitely that's like a big thing that i do believe needs to needs to be done and certainly at least a big conversation that that needs to happen and particularly i think in in a country that uh, like sweden where you know we pride ourselves on our you know great achievements when it comes to gender equality when it comes to other things um so that's you know yes i would point towards the the financial sector um, but I do also think um, all of these discussions around the history of innovation do matter. Um, it, I mean, many people are, are unaware even of very recent things, you know, like when my, when my mother in the early 1980s um, started studying computer science in Lund, that was still, you know, quite a normal career for, for women. It was still quite a female dominated field. And this is not um, very, very far back in history. And I saw all of that, for example, change during my own childhood. You know, how, you know, tech went from a field where, you know, women were the first programmers, women invented software. Many of my mother's managers were, were female and how tech then turned into this sort of almost completely male-dominated field and how we just forgot about even this very recent history of it. Um, so I do think that type of perspective is, is, is important on, on the economy and on you know, how, you know, how technology has been defined in different eras and how that is connected to, to our definitions about male and female. Um, <clears throat> you said something that was very interesting there about uh, venture capital. If you just stay there for a second, uh, in your uh, job as a financial journalist, have you found examples of 
um, investors trying to do things differently. Do you have, what have you seen? What? Yes, I mean, there, so there is quite a lot uh, happening. Uh, I mean, my impression is, and it might be wrong, um, but that maybe more might be happening in, in other countries than, than Scandinavia in particular around these things uh, is becoming a very big thing here in London. Um, um, and um, numbers also do look you know, better, for example, in, in the US than they do in, in Sweden. Um, so yes, I mean, there are, there are lots of things being done, both sort of within the, the venture capital space and uh, outside of it. And, you know, clearly angel investors, you know, do things differently if they want to, and, and many are. And um, there are, you know, organizations trying to set up things like, you know, non-profit funds that, you know, lend zero interest percent loans to female entrepreneurs. And so there's, there's lots of things going on, but, um, you know, they need to be scaled. And I do also think that on a on a natural national level, when you know we think about innovation as as countries and from the perspective of policy and politics, this is something that needs you know we need to we need to look at it, especially given uh, how huge of an impact you know successful businesses in the tech space can have on everything from. Um, you know, the fact that there are electric scooters everywhere on the sidewalks to, you know, the, the labor market for taxi drivers or, you know, we know that ideas, you know, because they can be scaled and the way venture capital works today, the ones that succeed can, can have, you know, tremendous impact on society and even democracy itself. And if these ideas come from a, a, a pool where 99% are men, I, I do think we have a problem that's also something for, for public policy and, uh, and politicians to, to at least look into. Uh, and also, do you have any thoughts on uh, what can be done from politics or support systems like universities and uh, to change this? From the system, um, so to I say. Mean, yeah, I mean, I do think, I do think many universities are are trying to to do things already, but you know, I think it's it's probably not enough. Um, and I think it also it's it's what I show in the book, and I think that's why many readers, uh, unfortunately, find it quite depressing, is how how deep some of these things go. It's like, it goes to the core of, you know, many of these things goes to the core of how we define technology and define innovation, which, you know, end up having, you know, very long history. So um, I think really there's a lot to be done in just widening what we think of when we talk about tech or technology or innovation and try to sort of move away from these definitions I mean, if you believe what I write in the book, you might not agree, you know, it's how, you know, because those are very much based on, you know, um, a male definition of things where women's innovations have been excluded. Um, so it goes to the, to the core of how we even see, you know, what is, what is technology, what is tech, what is an innovation? And I do think certainly, you know, universities can be in quite a good space to, to try to challenge these things. Um, even in how, you know, things are set up internally. Um. Great. <clears throat> and also, I know that you are, you are interested in the future and uh, listening to you today here are a lot of uh, female researchers from Lund University and also other universities. Uh, would you like to take the opportunity to send some some message along <laughs> now, that, now that they are here and uh, thinking about going on an entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I I try not to sort of offer advice about things I haven't done myself. So, <laughs> um, 
being somebody who hides in my room writing books, I don't know if I'm like the, <laughs> the right person to, to come with sort of that type of battle advice that, <laughs> that I'm sure is, is needed. But, you know, just that I, I salute you and, um, um, you know, please, please do it and, um, and don't let sort of uh, people who write books about how deep many of the structures that you meet every day go um you know persuade you to <laughs> to not do it <laughs> that's good advice <laughs> yeah. uh, we have a couple of more minutes here so i i uh, thought i would actually ask the the audience if someone has a question for catherine now that she is here with us no yes An odd question coming up. Can you hear him? I can't hear anything, so okay, you have sorry. to repeat it. Um, yes. You have to repeat it. It has, it has to do with gardening. Can you hear me now? Oh. <laughs> Can you hear me now? So. Yes. No? Yes. Okay. I, 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 my question is about gardening, uh, oh. because we're very interested in it, and, uh, and when we talk about it, we often come around to uh, the difference, extreme differences between gardens. Some people's idea of a garden is uh, a square thing with a neatly trimmed hedge around it and a bit of grass, which you can cut with a robot, uh, and you see a lot of those. Uh, quite near where we live, you see lots and lots of those. And, and it's probably my feeling that they're either um, thought out and looked after by a man um, <laughs> or, or a woman under the influence of one, possibly. Um, <laughs> and they're extremely boring. And then there are other gardens, which I hope ours would represent, which are, are not at all like that, which are all over the place. and. Uh, and it just seems to me that, that it is quite an interesting thought that there are sort of feminine and masculine gardens, quite simply. And uh, if you look at the kind of companies that offer services around gardening, you, know, you get things like um, Mike or Pelle's Tragord Service, uh, who are probably very good at doing the excavating and come in with a, a bobcat and dig things out for you. <laughs> but it, you might want to um, involve someone with a more feminine approach if you want to finish up with a, a more interesting place to spend your spare time. It wasn't really a question, I suppose, but I would like to know if you're interested in gardening. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you, are you, are you aware that my husband is a trained garden designer? Because uh, I just feel that this whole question is some kind of setup up from, um, uh, like that is literally um, <laughs> we haven't, we haven't <laughs> what he used to do. Um, so I, uh, I don't know if I can answer this question. I think it's, I think it's interesting. I think my, my, my husband would, yeah, I, I can't answer this. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I haven't thought much about gardening, particularly <laughs> when it comes to male and, and female. And uh, I'm blessed with a very beautiful garden myself that's looked after by my husband. And I'm afraid that anything I say here could be kind of used against me. Uh, but it's interesting. And I mean, a larger point is that, you know, we, it's, it's something that really struck me when working on this book is just how fundamental, you know, this, this idea, this is male, this is female how fundamental this urge we have to divide everything into this is and how it can really hold us back because we do sort of assign things to different gender on a very, very almost random basis. And we really let these things hold us back. You know, oh, computer programming, it's female because it's about following instructions. So it's almost like, like uh, cooking from a recipe, which women do. And then, you know, a couple of decades later, no, it's male because it has to do with this particular type of rationality that only men have. And, and these things can sound silly because they often are silly, but they do really influence the economy and innovation in very big ways, which I try to show in the book. And um, so, so, yes, that was just the... 
just how deep many of these things go was was something that really really struck me. But I, I do not dare to sort of apply it to, to Bologna. Sorry. <laughs> do we have another question? Yes. Hi. Um, I had a question. Since you're a journalist. I reckon that uh, uh, the media plays a quite large part in some of this as well. And I know that uh, uh, one of my colleagues up at Architecture, she discovered in her thesis work that uh, from the classic furniture that was selected when people were, when she looked at this research on how they became classics, media played a really large role in identifying mm -hmm. um, some of these classics and pushing them forward. Uh, and what do you think could be done about that? That's that's extremely interesting. Um, yes, and I, I certainly think that the way you know we in the media have reported and are reporting on innovation and startup culture is is problematic. Almost always a man, and you know he has an has an idea and then ends up sort of changing everything. Um, that's a narrative that we have been largely manufacturing, um, and also you know, how, how innovation is, is expressed, you know, using those wor words that I was talking about earlier, you know, disrupting and crushing and dominating this sort of, um, that kind of connection that is certainly, um, you know, we, you have that a lot in, in, the, in the financial press. Um, you have it, you know, within, I would say, sort of, you know, popular economics or, you know, the way we talk about it in, in a lot of that type of management literature. And it's it's certainly very very problematic, and it needs to be be challenged. Um, I don't see that happening yet, but uh, but I hope I hope it will be. Great. Do we have a last question for Catherine? No, they all seem yes. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Uh, my question is about the definition of innovation, uh, that it has to be broadened. And then I think that the investors who are in this business, they have the smaller uh, perspective on innovation. And then I wonder if we need someone else to take the role of seeing, of seeing the larger picture. Um, and who, who should that be? <laughs> Rather than the investor, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I do think, you know, at least, you know, from a, a national level, level and in particularly because, you know, lots of people um, more, much more clever than me, you know, are saying that we're in, you know, we're in a second machine age and, you know, our lives are being reshaped by, by tech and innovation at, you know, a, a rate that we will look back at and uh, in wonder. Um, there certainly is, you know, a role for national governments and national innovation strategies to, um, to look at these things and to look at these things properly from a, a gender perspective as well. Uh, and see what what can be done. Then obviously, what you then do depends on you know where you come from politically. But but I do think it does need to be an an a bigger issue um, because if, if you look at you know the aggregated problem that this does create the exclusion of of women from this from this sphere. Um, but then I do also think that investors should be and can hopefully be convinced that it's in their interest to to do things differently um i mean even because women are as a consumer group for example extremely powerful you know there are estimates that women influence around 80 percent of all um consumer decisions in the global economy so women are very very powerful there so there should be you know the fact that so little investment is directed towards women while women are simultaneously the world's most powerful consumer that points to some kind of market failure that there should be you know investors wanting to come in and fill um and i hope and hopefully i think they they will realize that and hopefully a few you know the more successful examples we have of these things then that will sort of bring more people people on on board so 
um, I, I can be optimistic uh, as well. But, and, and things are slowly happening, but, but not, not fast enough. Great. Thank you, Catherine. I have a last question for you. Since you are such an inspiration to all of us, <laughs> where do you get your inspiration? Do you have any, I mean, on the topic, do you have any suggestions of literature, podcasts or studies that uh, we could read if we want to dig deeper? Um, I mean, um, there, is, there is a lot, um, obviously, that, I mean, for, for the work on this book, I was looking at, at many very obscure things and and many of the things on, on this topic are you know they're either out of print or or kind of hard to find but i mean if you haven't this is vaguely connected if you haven't read invisible women for example by caroline criado perez which is about data Great and how a lot of things um, are developed using data only coming from men and what that can lead to anything from, you know, cars being less safe for women to uh, mobile phones being very awkward. That is a, a great sort of current book to, to read. Super, thank you. And yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Uh, thank you. And uh, say hi to London for me. I will, thank you. And it's uh, great to be in Lund, even though I'm not physically in Lund. Yeah, but you, it's, uh, yes. you have to come some other time. I will, yes. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, okay, so now we have a little break. So I, if we are, we say we we will be back in 20 minutes, so we can mingle a little bit and try to digest everything that we have heard together. So 10 minutes to three, we'll meet here again.
Okay, welcome back everyone uh, and welcome dear panelists. Uh, this is an impressive group of researchers that are on different entrepreneurial journeys. Uh, and I would like to start by introducing you, or rather let you introduce yourselves and say a few words on what it is that you are doing. And at the same time, I'm, I'm going to check your pitching skills. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See if you have a, a one-liner. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, but I would like to start with you, Isabel. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What What is it that you are doing in your research, and what is it that you're thinking that you? Uh, how How do you want, want to take that research to a market? Okay. Do I have a time or? <laughs> no, just. <laughs> well. So, shall I present myself yes, in, the, in the pitch or yeah. before the pitch? Uh, you decide. Okay, well, <laughs> anyway, things are going wrong directly. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Isabel Gonsalves. I'm a cardiologist, so a heart doctor. Uh, and I'm a professor, so I do lots of research. And uh, I think I'm an embryo of uh, an innovator. Uh, so... Um, I do research in a disease called atherosclerosis and that is the underlying disease to most cardiovascular diseases in the world. And by the way, cardiovascular diseases are the number one cause of death and disability in the world. So if we have 10 minutes yes, we do. here, uh, in these 10 minutes, 10 people will die of cardiovascular diseases. And every half minute, one person will have a heart uh, or a stroke, a heart attack or a stroke in this period. So this is what I do for a living. I take care of these people. Uh, and um, I study the disease that underlies these deaths, heart attacks and strokes. And in this disease, the, the fundament of this disease is that plaques uh, accumulate fat deposits, accumulate in the vessel walls, in arteries. And uh, we have been collecting these samples and studied them to see which plaques really give heart attacks and strokes or not, because most people will have these plaques, this disease. But not everybody will die of it. So our aim is actually to find methods to distinguish these plaques that really will give you a heart attack, a stroke, or kill you, versus those plaques that will not. And for this, we that now I'm coming to the innovator part. Uh, me and uh, colleagues, engineer colleagues um, from the LTH here in Lund University, uh, this engineer's brilliant team has we have been developing a new ultrasound technique, you know, ultrasound like you do for the babies, but for the vessels, so that we really try to distinguish the dangerous plaques from the non-dangerous plaques. And with this, we believe that we will, with an easy, cheap technique, um, save lives and decrease the suffering for people. Great. Yeah. Was this fast no, enough? No, that's great. That's great. <laughs> and I'm uh, curious about how how um, uh, how far are you on your entrepreneurial journey? You say that you are in like an embryo of, of innovation, but I guess you don't feel as an uh, feel like an entrepreneur yet, or? Well, um, not really. But I really like this discussion that started a bit with Catherine, mm -hmm. because. We don't really have a company yet, so, so I cannot call me an entrepreneur like that, but I think I can call me an innovator in the sense that we are having ideas and we are testing them. And um, we have sent the, the file, the patent, and we are in the process of, of uh, getting more and more funding. And we have had to have different types of support that we might discuss later on. Um, so, so I think we are some steps, but I definitely have a lot to learn. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here, not mm. only to share the little I've learned, but mm. also to learn from your experiences. And um, yes, so... Um, and, and also because I think we have to be more people trying to help out, mm. and particularly more women uh, yeah. to help out 
in this innovative journey and maybe not being afraid of doing it, even if you are a doctor, mm. uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I was not educated as an engineer or a real scientist. It started as a hobby. So, mm. so yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, then I would like to move on to Lisa. Yes, I, I also started with the research in the, the University of Copenhagen and the University of Southern Denmark. So my name is Lisa and I am a biologist and biogeochemist. So I work with phosphorus and an exper expert on nutrients uh, in the soil and water, not in the body. <laughs> so, but um, I'm engaged with things like um, the global things and uh, phosphorus is a limited resource that we have and in the Western world we are actually overusing it to, to grow food, to grow crop on farmland. And that overuse causes um, that it leaks out in the oceans and also eutrophicate and uh, make things in the water grow, causing fish death and algal growth and so on. So I, together with some other researchers at the University of Copenhagen, we took, uh, we developed a filter material that can, by forcing water to go through this filter material in a column, you can prevent phosphorus from coming out in the oceans from farmland and so on. And uh, also an invention that I came up with later that I have patented is how to then remove the phosphorus from the filter and um, reuse it as a new product for fertilizers. And in the same time, the filter gets recharged and can be used again. So you have, you prevent eutrophication in the ocean, you can reuse the limited resource, and you have a filter that lasts longer. And this is very good because filters in, in the landscape are often very expensive to exchange. So instead you clean them and you just exchanged the pollutant or the fertilizer. So that is our idea. And you can use it for industrial water, for when you, everything with food production, everywhere where there is phosphorus. So I have started a little, little pilot production now in Olnarp, SLU, the un Agricultural University, outside there. So I'm going to hit the market maybe this autumn, but next year. Yay. So if you're more interested, you can go into diapure.eu. D-I-A-P-U-R-E dot e -U. <laughs> If you want to learn more. Great. And I, I happen to know that you are a few years into your, so to say, entrepreneurial yes. journey. Do you feel as an, like an entrepreneur? I feel like an entrepreneur, yes. Mm -hmm. But when you asked me the first time after <laughs> one year, I did not. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I'm, if you're an uh, embryo, I'm a cocoon. Okay. <laughs> trying to become a butterfly or something. <laughs> yeah. So a butterfly this fall then when it is yes, market? Yes, then I'm okay. coming out as a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. And then uh, Charlotte? Yes, um, I am an associate professor in strategic communication. I'm also a vice dean at the Faculty of Social Sciences, being responsible for external engagement. And in addition to that, uh, and maybe the reason why I'm here today, I'm also the co-founder of a company called Conval Research, uh, which was based on a research project uh, which was called Communicative Organization, which I uh, conducted together with uh, a group of research colleagues. In Conval Research, we measure, analyze, and develop internal communication processes. And when I say internal communication processes, I'm thinking about leadership, co-workership, communication climate, and, and such things. And I don't know whether you think about it, but I am sure that most of you spend most of your working time communicating with other people, 
But in spite of that, we seldom measure or reflect upon what really works in our internal communication. And we do not consider very carefully how we can use internal communication to increase engagement, change and innovation capacity, and how we can use it to support leadership and co-workership. But that is what we are trying to, to solve, what we are trying to contrib contribute with. Um, I think that was Great. my pitch. Yeah, super. <laughs> and yeah. are you an entrepreneur? Uh, or are you a researcher? Or both? I'm a hobby entrepreneur, okay. perhaps. <laughs> uh, as, I mean, maybe that's one of my struggles, that I try to combine several different missions and roles. Um, but entrepreneur, no, I don't think no. I would use that as a label. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm first and foremost a researcher, but a rather applied researcher interested in how I can make my research results used mm. uh, without uh, outside academia. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm. And last but not least, Susanna. Yes. So um, I am one of 2,600 speech language pathologists in Sweden. And I'll, for short, I'll call it an SLP. That's logoped in Swedish. And as such, I've specialized in voice pathology. And uh, that means that I can help people that have voices that no longer suffice for their everyday communication because they have suffered some kind of hoarseness that has to do with either an underlying uh, ailment or illness or a misuse of the voice. So um, an allegory or a, a parallel that's maybe easier to grasp is that I'm sort of a physiotherapist for the voice. Mm. Yes but I'm a speech-language pathologist, I'm not a physio. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, that field, the voice pathology, is also my research field. And it is the field that my, the company that I'm a co-founder of and a shareholder in, Voice Diagnostic Sweden, uh, is trying to um, cater to. And we are trying to well, we're seeking to perform a digital upgrade of uh, voice therapy and of voice health prevention as well. And by doing so, we are working on an app-based system that will um, try and monitor changes to the voice back on the progress of how they're doing with their voice. Either they're trying to improve their voice or just monitoring passively how something underlying is developing through the voice. So um, I know why, why strange things may happen to the voice, so I can explain that. And I have lovely colleagues in my company, uh, in the company, in our company, that know how to calculate what parts of the signal is uh, important to look at. And to, together we can help uh, develop my research field, and I am going to answer your question on whether I'm an entrepreneur or not. I just have an inkling it was coming. <laughs> I, I get my first paycheck this month as an entrepreneur. So as of this month, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I'm a, a teacher at the, the speech language pathology program here in Lund Univers at Lund University, and I, I'm also a an active researcher in the field. Mm. Great. Thank you for your introductions. Um, I'm a little bit curious now, since you have been listening to Catherine, and I know that at least one of you have read uh, the book. You are even holding it now. Two yeah. of us. Two of us <laughs> <laughs> you have read the book. Uh, what are your immediate thoughts around what Catherine is talking about? Just me. Reflections? Yes. Uh, yes, I. As you said, I was first depressed because I thought, what can I ever... Now, now, now that I know this, <laughs> I want to forget it again. Because if I'm going to continue with this, uh, it's going to be tough. 
But at the same time, I think that what she's really saying is we should focus less on gender and more on the products and the and innovations. And I agree totally on that, because that is what I struggle with every, every day, actually. But also, of course, we shouldn't forget that there are 99% of the investment going to men, and in my business, clean tech, there's 99.8% that goes to men. Mm -hmm. And most of this finance is coming from governmental uh, companies, so n almost no private uh, investments. And that makes it very difficult because we all know, especially in medicine, that it takes a long time for an invention to come to reach the market. So in our case, we're not only women, we're also researcher getting into a new field that we don't know or have education in, the entrepreneurship. And we also have a, a product that often, when it comes from the university, are not a, 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 a clear product. It takes another eight years. So the fin financials are so important. And uh, I think this book can really uh, push some buttons there. I hope so, and I hope it's getting uh, people are reading it too, even if, even men. Because I think, as she says again, we should focus less on gender, and and th that's all our responsibility. Mm. Yeah, that's my c conclusion. Any other reflections? Yes, I have a reflection. Mm? Uh, sorry. No, go. Okay. Um, and it was something maybe not talked about as much in the, in the talk today, but uh, that Catherine Marcel mentions in the book is the difference of understanding, uh, is it Kasparov, the chess player, uh, the genius of him com as compared to the genius of Serena Williams when she smashes the tennis ball over the court. Um, and because that's one of my take-home messages from the book. That's because um, the technology that we're trying to develop within our company will not ever replace the one-to-one -one meeting from a clinician's point of view to a patient. We will never be able to replace that because we are human, because we cannot uh, ever probably, according to Catherine Marcel anyway, uh, calculate everything that we can't plan that ha that happens. Is that my microphone happening? Hmm? Don't like it. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Better? Mm -hmm. Yes. No popcorn. Thanks. Um, so whatever um, uh, happens within the meeting of two people, we will never probably be able to generate by artificial intelligence because there's so much that we cannot anticipate that's going to happen in that meeting, in that room. So I thought that was just a, such a, a nice and clear picture that I needed uh, when I explain what we can and cannot do or, and should and should not do mm. in the, my research and in, uh, in the company that we're developing. Mm. Great. And you had something also. I thought it was really fascinating how clear it became when Catherine was talking that what we perceive as an innovation is a social construction. Mm. <laughs> and I think that we still are very focused on, on products, as you mentioned. Uh, we're still very focused on technology. And for me, as coming from social sciences, I think we, we also need to think more of innovation as uh, new services uh, by human beings, sometimes in combinations with technology, data, AI, and so forth. But the combination could be really interesting to look more into. So I think, it's, to me, it's, it's about gender but it's also about how we view, how we define what is an innovation. Mm. Because if, if we don't look at these two things at the same time, I don't think we will make any real, real progress here. Yes, and, and I agree. And I, I was also thinking, no, I lost it. 
<laughs> yeah, I will come back. I can comment while yeah. you come yes. back. I I felt I felt high with her talk. I felt yes, I totally agree. Uh, I felt this myself, and it felt like uh, it was a bit of um, reinsurance. And she did a, a proper research and saw several sources that reinforced what we have been seeing in our daily lives, but we probably didn't dare to say mm -hmm. enough. So this reinsurance and the awareness that, okay, there is a gender bias or whatever we want to call it, there are differences, but okay, let's face it, we cannot change this. Let's then empower the women so that instead we dare and solve the things that have been drawing us back, holding us back, and instead, let's move together. Now, there are books, there, there's knowledge. We are sitting here today. Mm. We are putting the spotlight on this. Mm. Then let's go for the next step. Let's start pushing it against this boring, historical, societal, as you were saying, uh, hurdles, and let's move on. So, so I got really empowered, and I got Great. even more, <laughs> even happier to be here. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I remember now. Um, I, I just thought that what you said in the beginning was really good too, because it's the way of changing the way of thinking. Mm. It's so important. Mm. Because, and it, it, it comes to gender, it comes to global thinking, it comes to every, uh, entrepreneurship. So that is even more important, and we need to change quite fast now <laughs> mm. because what as you say what is an innovation i mean we often think of technology as you said but uh, with the co2 for example we need to do something fast we need we push in money in inve inventing new ideas how to reduce co2 but you could also give the money to a far to a forest owner so that he wouldn't cut down his trees for 30 mm. years that would also be a new way of thinking, mm. an inventive thought. Mm. But would we give money for that? Mm. I don't know. Because yeah. it's not innovation. Mm. So it's a new way of thinking, I think. It's a, it's a bit along the lines of uh, this general income, public income that uh, Catherine Marcel talks about in the book as well, isn't it? It's uh, uh, the thought that if we innovate people out of the, of the work uh, force because we don't need them anymore. What are they going to do with their mm. lives? <laughs> so maybe yeah. just paying somebody to help in a passive way might be some of the way forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, the, and these are the kind of thoughts, I think, and, and innovations that actually uh, the faculties for, at universities can come up with. We had a discussion before on, on uh, that fact that almost all innovation actually comes from, in this case, LTH, is often like the, the, the tech solutions that we talk about and that gets investments and stuff. But um, I, I really, really think that uh, we have to look at the, uh, the more, yeah, the, the kind of work that you come from also. And, um, and try to, to see things in totally new ways. Uh, and, 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 and we can't do that, you can't do that by yourself. We have to, everyone has to be a part of it. So, and that's also a problem that we kind of, uh, we live in these silos. We, live, we, we tend to be in, within our group and we see the world at the same way. But I think the faculties also have to like meet and uh, find like new platforms and new ways of uh, thinking together. Um, yeah. Um, well, if we go back a little bit to your entrepreneurial journeys again, uh, I'm I'm curious about what motivated you to take your research to market. Uh, was it like an instant? Uh, revelation, or has, is it like a long process? 
You're nodding, Isabel. What are you? What oh, were you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I tend to talk with my body. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, f- for me it was very easy, very spontaneous. Because yeah. I mean, I'm actually trained to help people. That's my real job mm-hmm. <laughs> or my education formally. So of course the the aim is. I, tr- I really want to save people so or to, to decrease their suffering. So that's a very easy motivation. Yeah. And, and I got trained for that. So that's easy. Now, the next step, which I think might be a, a hurdle f- for many women, um, and that this I, I actually discovered, I was in a Women Transforming Leadership course in, in Oxford a couple of years ago. Um, and, and I realized there was there were women from all over the world and like from Google to Russia, yeah, mining companies, whatnot. And you know, they were, these women, they were brilliant, but they were all very scared. Uh, well, some more than others, but they were all very cautious about, do I really manage, am I enough? So I think even the own image of some women uh, maybe even from childhood needs to be reinforced and and pepped up that you you are good enough your ideas can be heard um, and th- that I thought it was only me really uh, by my personality but actually with those women they were brilliant mm. but they were also doubtful and caring and you know like when you talked we have a little company or a little <laughs> we are so <laughs> careful and then in oxford we talked a lot about this how women sit and women talk a man would never say i have a little idea here i have an idea you know they would they would stand so one exercise would be just stand op- you know legs open stand there and you know when i was brought up i was a woman should never have the legs open you should sit like this like this you know and, and in Oxford, we did ventilate this, and, and I did another course, like, okay, stand there, like, you know, take place. Those Only. women are so afraid to take place. Mm. So, so I, think, I think we need the motivation, but we need to, to raise these women, young girls, and boys for all. I mean, everybody should mm. be able to have this courage you can actually do it mm. you know because daring to go into innovation or is my idea any worth maybe not really you know that step was maybe the biggest hurdle because mm. then when you dare to discuss your idea with engineers or with other scientists with other faculties then things you see oh you can improve this for those patients or for you know those that don't speak well or whatever but there are lots of needs out there it's just we have to dare and i think this step of daring mm. is a big hurdle that we probably don't often talk about because we don't dare uh so empowerment once again i, mm. I think it's a big thing and we probably need to do it as a society from young age yes i just want to agree with that and wanted to just to add my thought on it is yes there's daring involved, and yes, women need to dare to do, to realize their dreams and thoughts, and just try. Maybe if it's just good enough, it doesn't have to be top of the line or perfect before we open our mouths. Um, but daring takes practice. Mm. So I really agree with you that it needs to take place early in life. Uh, and that's my answer to that question is, I was... I don't know if it was how I was raised, but it's how I've always been. I'm a yes woman. If I see an opportunity, I go for it. If, I, if I, there's a question posed, I say yes, because I've practiced that way. I've done that all my life. For, for whatever reason, if there's an opportunity and I like it, it sounds good, it sounds nice, it sounds cool, it sounds like it could help maybe partly quench my vast thirst for knowledge, then I'll go for it. Mm. But it takes practice. Yeah. So it was, it was uh, um, if I read between the lines, it was uh, you deciding to become an entrepreneur was quite an easy decision then. Well, it wasn't, it was my decision, yes. <laughs> Nobody forced me or coerced <laughs> me into this at all. But the question was posed to me. Oh, okay. do you, would you like to do ah, this? Okay. Would you like to come on this journey mm. with us? 
Okay. So it was easy for me to say yes. Yeah. I didn't have to be the start plug. Hmm. I didn't have to have the original idea. I was invited to join a team. Hmm. Uh, so that made it much easier for me. And all the more joyful to work with, not having to be the start plug for once. <laughs> uh, the spark plug is the word I'm looking for. But I don't... I don't have to come up with all the ideas. I don't have to. Um, I don't have to drag everyone along behind me. Not that I do that in every other situation, but I can work at a fast pace, and and everyone else is already up and running. Mm. So it was easy, yes. Mm. But that is actually a very uh, interesting point you're making because you, you, I think sometimes you tend to think that being an entrepreneur is something you do by yourself. You have to like, yeah, but it's important to think that you can do it with others also. And you, you don't have to do like everything uh, and do every part of being an entrepreneur either because you can, you can do what you are good at and then other people can do other stuff as well. So, uh, yeah. How was it for you, Lisa? I, I, was, I think I was very practical about it because I, I did my PhD on phosphorus and how it works chemically in soil and water. And then I was out in the industry and worked a little bit with clean tech and, and so on. And then I get, got back and did my PhD, um, postdoc year on Copenhagen University and we worked with this filter material. We have a large group working on it. My, my um, role was to evolve this material and write, finish up the patent application. And there were two big companies involved too. And the, and the university was hoping that these two companies would take over this patent, which was a great idea. But I could see when the tech trust office at the university and the companies were talking, they were talking past each other with different, uh, you know, mindsets. So it didn't really happen. And I was thinking, oh my God, this is so important. I believe in this idea and no one is like picking it up and taking it out. So I thought, well, if I do, they will see that I, I suffer and I take the action I, and I do it. And then they will be like, yes, we want this. So that's why I started the company. And I, had n I have a lack of concept thinking, I guess, because <laughs> I didn't think about the woman or anything. I was just thinking like, this product needs to be used and we have a global <laughs> problem and we need to solve it now. <laughs> that's, that's my, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's quick fix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how was it for you? I think it was like some mixed motives. Uh, I mean, we finished this research project, which I mentioned. And, and published a report, which a more popular science report, which gained a lot of attention. So I and my colleagues, we thought, what a waste if we don't do anything more about this. What a waste. Uh, and, and we sort of had already been a team of colleagues who had been always um, found it f really nice and, and satisfying to, to talk to the community outside academia. So we had a network and we knew that there was an interest in, interest in what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So on one way it was, what a waste if we don't do it. And on the other hand, I was also part, I was working quite closely with the innovation office at Lund University, the LU, Innova LU Innovation. And I also had a role uh, which was focused on, on trying to encourage and um, more innovation within my own faculty. So I thought, well, I have this chance. Uh, there is an interest in my research, and I know that there is a great support system. I can't, I can't sort of don't do anything now. <laughs> I need mm. to do it. Mm. Uh, so it, it was more of an opportunity uh, I took uh, than a plan <laughs> or anything mm. else, mm. actually. Mm. Mm. Um, and then I would like to um, talk a little bit about uh, the, the two roles of being uh, a researcher and being an entrepreneur. Uh, and uh, the difficulties or the, yeah, the, the difficulties that you might face uh, in this doing both, so to say. Uh, what are your experiences here? 
Yeah, I, I did my PhD and postdoc, and uh, I really wanted to be a researcher, but it's, I knew it was impossible. So I saw the chance to become an entrepreneur in a way to continue working with my, what I know and my skills. But as soon, I was feeling a little bit uh, that when you leave academia, you go to the other side. Mm. in a way, because then you're not us with them. And, and al also in environmental uh, uh, groups, it's more like, do you work for the in our environment or for the economics in a way? So, so taking the step over, I, I lost some respect. <laughs> I don't know, but I, it feels like a little bit like that. Okay, she's not a researcher. It's a little bit of a loss, yes. But okay, she's working there with a little bit more economics. Mm. And, and in, in the business world, I think it's also a little bit, okay, she's a researcher. She doesn't know anything about business. <laughs> Oh, where should, <laughs> where should we start? And, and I mean, I don't really belong at any place, really. Mm. But I think by calling myself an entrepreneur, I found myself being both a researcher and some business person. Because uh, for, for me, entrepreneurship is invention and making it uh, be... Um, um, I have to... No, um, give money. <laughs> oh, profitable. profitable. Invention and profitable. And I think that's a good uh, combination of what I do. But the feeling of uh, abandoning or, or uh, being something less, is that something you, you actually, was people telling you that or was it more no, of a No, but I know what I was thinking myself before. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but no, 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 it's, it's in some way. But, but you can also say that um, it's a difficult step because you have to change your thinking, your way of thinking, mm. really a lot. And that was a little bit of a shock for me, how, how difficult I was thinking as a researcher and now as an entrepreneur. Interesting, interesting trip. And, and I, I mean, there are many positive things to say about it also, of course. Mm. But I think it's really interesting to listen to you that, and talking about us and them. And I think we do have a serious problem here, both within academia and within the society as a whole. Because I think we, it's like we need to choose either or. And I would like the university and the surrounding society to make it more easy to go back and forth and to do both at, at the same time as mm. well, because it's a little bit, I've also felt the pressure to decide, do you really want to go for this? Then you need to leave academia, otherwise the investors will not be interested in your company. And if not, you are uh, prepared to, to leave academia, then you need to find some private money to show that you are prepared to to, to sort of invest your own money in this. So a lot of pressure to choosing either or. And I think we need to find better ways to do both. Um, but I think it's also a matter of, of norms and culture within academia yeah. that we need to also change from the inside, actually. <laughs> uh, and it will take time, but I see some, some developments now. And, and, and I think it it might also differ a little bit between different disciplines and faculties. There are, I mean, according to my own prejudices, uh, engineering school and medicine, you are a little more uh, innovation friendly than perhaps my, and entrepreneurial friendly, and uh, than my own faculty are. I'm not sure uh, if I, I, I am right, but we tend to see commercialization as some kind of devil's tool sometimes. That's a no, yeah. no. Yeah. Commercialization. That's yeah. That's the evil world in okay. yeah. I think so. A yeah, lot. but it can be a tool to do social good as well. But I think so. I think, yeah, we do have some uh, culture work to do as well. Mm. Uh, I really agree. I, I think, um, well, uh, I think we should. I think the key is, as you were both saying, it's a pity we are putting it as incompatible. Uh, issues because to move on we really need 
to join hands. The, the science, whatever, in which field, it's far too difficult to be separated. We have to join hands. But I see very clearly when you write a manuscript or an article, if you say Dr. X has uh, invented this and has the company Zeta, and that is the aim of this paper, the reviewers will directly or highly probably say, oh, this has a bias. Uh, so that's very, in a way it's correct because you don't want also the company, your company or someone's company to drive the, the maliciously the, the product you are proposing. On the other hand, you do need the help and the, the input of other experts that belong to the company uh, to bring the innovation forward faster. You really need to be fast to help these people or to help the environment or whatever it is. So, so um, I don't really have an answer, but I, I see the incompatibilities very clearly on everyday work with these papers that you produce in academia. And I see the need of having the companies to really move yeah. faster. And uh, sadly, I don't have a suggestion how to improve it. But I think at least the awareness as we are raising today, for instance, is at least a step. Uh, and maybe we as entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs try at least to be careful and, and give a positive image of our innovation and of our products without bringing the, the, the money aspect too strongly. But of course, it's, it's also present. So we cannot blind for that. It's, we cannot blind for gender. We cannot blind for money. They're there. Mm. It's more we have to find a balanced way to, to live with it, right? Mm. What yes. do you, yeah, you think? Yeah, I, I, um, I have a slightly different take on the question, I think. Um, and I was thinking more on, along the lines of how how my own field would, will accept and would accept innovation and entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship uh, within the field. Because um, I was thinking along the lines of, is it easier to be an entrepreneur or more difficult than I thought it would be? And um, it's both. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's it's easier in a way because I've been taught and I've been told that what we are trying to do cannot be done. However, however, we are doing it. So I don't know what people have tried, but I think I'm enjoying an interdisciplinary, as we were talking about earlier, an interdisciplinary team that is absolutely pivotal for this to, to, to come off the ground in any way. But it is also more difficult <laughs> than I thought it might be because um, because of views within the field, um, it is said that what we're trying to do within my company, especially as it has to do with signal processing and understanding the voice in an acoustic, from an acoustic perspective is, and this is actually a quote from, um, he shall not be named here <laughs> because I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, blacklist anybody, but I have been told when I was learning this that no, SLPs don't do this. They can't do this. You don't have to know this. And of course, I went straight for it and I wanted to know more. <laughs> Why? What's, what's lurking behind that heavy door over there? So it was more difficult uh, and it has been more difficult because traditionally SLPs or logopeda, that we don't do this kind of thing. It's left to the engineers and the phoneticians, i.e. the men. <laughs> it is, mm. really. So it has been more difficult from that point of view. And, um, but also from a female perspective, uh, with, within the field, it has been more difficult because my field is quite often um, accused of being non-theoretical, uh, as void of theory, uh, as opposed to langu language acquisition, for example, that has a, a great uh, history of theory and psychology and everything behind it. But this is just physics. Mm. This is just aerodynamics. Mm. So it is difficult sort of treading the path and finding the path 
forward within that. Uh, but that's more, my take on it was more within the field, not so much from the um, investor's point of view, perhaps. But do you, uh, do you feel like Lisa, that you are not a part of, uh, that you're in between somehow, or do you feel that you belong to no, I no. don't feel that way. And I agree with you, Charlotte. I think that there's a difference between faculties within the university, perhaps. I don't know much else than the one I, <laughs> I'm at, which is the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, and I collaborate with people within my company at uh, LTH. Mm. So I know more of those um, uh, contexts. Uh, and I have a very supportive employer. My boss is very supportive of me doing this. Uh, he wants me and us at our department to do more of this kind of work. So he's very supportive and they are very supportive above him as well. Mm. So I, I don't really feel that divide, mm. uh, rather the opposite, trying to get more innovation and entrepreneurship in. Mm. <sighs> Yeah, I'm thinking that universities, <laughs> they have such an obligation to take their uh, research and give it to the taxpayers because in a way they paid for the research. And, and, and I think that the entrepreneur is the link between that obligation and the taxpayers' uh, payback for this. And I think we should <laughs> get more credit for it because it's actually not my obligation, it's the university's obligation, and they cannot just print in, in closed uh, journals that is only available to researchers. They, it, it needs to come out in other ways too. And I thought I was a little bit of a hero starting this company and taking this great product out on the market. No one applauded me. Like, no one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> now I can rest. In peace. <laughs> but uh, I, I think actually that's a serious question because uh, who else is going to do this? Uh, uh, an, uh, a patent is just not a finished product. It's it's an idea. It needs to be formed into something physical, uh, physical like not technology, but uh, and, and a product somehow. And I think maybe, without knowing, that the universe is saying that now at our doors the invention stops and now it's just economic and business and so on. It's not. Mm. I'm a, still a researcher because I, most of what I do is research. Still, the product is not finished until it's someone who, who wants to buy it. Mm. And I think that is more, uh, that's something, and the society on the other, the taxpayers, politicians, they should be more interested in, in what the university has found in green solutions, for example, and see to that it get used mm. and make uh, good for the world. Mm. And that's also something I should, uh, well, the society needs to pay <laughs> for these things to happen. Um, yeah. That's what I had on my heart. Mm. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> I really feel with you. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a comment on that as well. And yeah. on the, this th um, third stream uh, job that we have to do as researchers as well, which actually is made easier for me, definitely, because um, this entrepreneurial journey or this um, innovation trip that I'm on uh, has opened up the opportunity for me to actually start a podcast on my research area. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't have had that time. No, not in a million years. I would have had that time to to be able to plan and proceed and record and, and actually get out the word about mm. voice pathology. Mm. So that's an opportunity as mm. well. Um, What's the name of the podcast? It's Röstresurser. Mm. It's in Swedish. <laughs> Röstresurser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it sounds really interesting uh, when I listen to you because, Susan, because you sounds like you have found a way to move quite smoothly between different roles. Mm. And your surrounding community of colleagues, they think it's great. No one looks at you with suspicion. And I think we need to find more 
kind of models like that, uh, when we sort of can have different roles and do different things at the same time and make them to uh, sort of um, create some synergy between them, just as you say. Uh, and sometimes I think it's like the innovation systems, uh, when it, the impression I get when I have this pressure to, to, I need to decide whether I should leave, whether I should stay or not. I think it's like, well, don't we want researchers to go back and forth, to do many things at the same time? Because otherwise it's like, we have one idea and then we go into business and then we never do research anymore. We want to, don't we want us to, to continue mm. to produce new ideas? But then we need some more flexibility. I think we need, you mentioned, uh, I think, translators, mm. uh, that we yeah. need to collaborate more in a more sort of innovative way, way actually, uh, where I can combine my ideas with other people who already are in the business. Uh, so more flexibility and more dynamic relationships and, and collaborations, I think that, that is important. Interesting. Mm. Very interesting. Um, if we move on a little bit to um, being uh, a female entrepreneur then. <laughs> uh, you said, Lisa, that you, you don't consider yourself, you, don't, you, you didn't think about the, the fact that you are a woman uh, being an entrepreneur. I did, but not really as, a <laughs> <laughs> as an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, but uh, is there, what, what image did you have of being an entrepreneur before you even considered uh, being one? What, what, what was an entrepreneur? Um, I th think they were dressed nicely, <laughs> <laughs> in opposite to, <laughs> to yeah. uh, university people. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, but they also, they were, um, I, I don't know, I, I, I was not thinking entrepreneur really. I was thinking researcher still, I think. I think I just needed to get this to someone who is an entrepreneur to, to take mm. over. I'm going to do this until someone takes over. That's okay. what I was thinking, so I don't really think I... I don't know. This was quite uh, eye-opening to me. I was talking to my lovely CEO at Voice Diagnostic, Louise Brange, about this. And she asked me, well, who do you think about when you think of an entrepreneur? I was just, my, 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 man after man after man came up mm. uh, in my head. It was, you know, Peter Stordal and, and <laughs> Elon Musk and... <laughs> Uh, other people who've d done other things, but it was it was men, basically. Mm. And she said, "Well, what about Oprah Winfrey? Mm. Hmm. Ah, what about um, Isabella Löwengrip? Yeah, like really good examples. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I associate with a man in a suit, carrying a briefcase, hurrying along Fifth Avenue in New York, mm. basically." Mm. With papers flying for some reason, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't have a phone. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm I don't know where that came from, but I'm a bit stuck in old um, uh, depict depictors, I think, of male entrepreneurs. Mm. Hmm. Have you found some other role models now when you have? Well, I've got my my CEO, Your of CEO, course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, I haven't looked too much, to be honest. I have too much <laughs> I've got too much to do. <laughs> I don't have time. <laughs> but um, I've definitely opened my eyes to it, to mm. the question, and I'm um, looking at it in a different way. Mm. Definitely. I know, Lisa, when we uh, spoke a few years ago, <laughs> you, you talked about the importance of role models. Yeah. You tried to find it, and you were so happy because you found some TV show that followed an entrepreneur. But yes. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Uh, do you still feel like that? Uh, have yes. you found any role models that you... No. No? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, yes, actually, some of those who st I got to know at the same time, started at approximately the same time as me, they have grown to be my uh, role models mm -hmm. because I can see they have gotten really far, introduced their compasses on the mar uh, in Bushen, in 
yeah, stock on, market. Stock on the market and uh, and getting large deals on million euro class. Uh, so so that has made me like you. But but it's still lacking, yes, because as you said, some it's a entrepreneur is something a, a certain entrepreneur <laughs> and often a man. But I was also thinking about the Roma. I, I was thinking about the support system too, because that is uh, something you need. Uh, if you don't have a role model, you need to have someone that believe in your uh, idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, the support system here in Lund, I think, is extraordinarily good. And if anyone is f afraid to start a business, don't be, not in Lund, because it's such a good uh, network of people working, especially at, on Ideon. And you, there are people working their hearts out uh, for you, for me, mm. uh, helping me with different things. And it's it's really... That's something that I think maybe an entrepreneur is better at, is actually networking and helping out mm. together. It's a very good community to be in. Mm. So um, that's... Yeah, there, there I really agree. I, th I think here it's quite a fantastic place. I mean, I, I'm Portuguese and I've worked in Germany and, and in Sweden and in Portugal. And this is definitely the best place that they really take care of you uh, concerning innovations. They don't talk you down. They really try to lift you up. So I, I really appreciate Sweden for this, you know, at least even the, the chance that you do a lot of research and are, and are something else like clinician or logoped or wh whatever, you know, it's such a, um, it's a very open society. Uh, and Lund University has at least, um, Karolinska was also quite good, but Lund University is fantastic in the innovation support and they, they have helped me, like training me for interviews and I, I felt so pampered and so fortunate to have such a support and I, that's one of the reasons why I actually like to chose to stay in Sweden because it's really a fantastic country. I don't know if they're out there other foreigners <laughs> that feel kind of confused and lost, but this is still the best country so far for, for, for me at least. And it's there is a big understanding for in medicine, uh, which is then my field, to, to that you have multiple roles and a bit going back. It is there is an incentive that you do different things and that you bring your ideas back to the clinic in my case or back to to the society. Um, and I think the the point of being a woman, I didn't really care too much about that in, from the beginning, but but we really should care more. And I see the networking that men do, it's unbeatable. They go to sauna together, <laughs> they drink together. I mean, they're all <laughs> naked there and doing these things. And but it's <laughs> deficient. <laughs> they're being vulnerable together. <laughs> I don't know, but the business coming off. I mean, I was not there. I, I not think sure, I'm not sure I want to be there either. <laughs> but I, I mean, this is happening, right? We all have seen this. So the, the thing is, well, I, I've not seen, but I've, I've heard. I've heard them inviting each other. Shall we hang out in the sauna, sauna and we can have a drink? <laughs> And I am like thinking, oh, I have to call my family. Did they get food, the kids? You know, so what I think we have to do to get this network of entrepreneurs is network more. We don't go to sauna, we go to have tea. Mm. You know, we go somewhere, we find our own thing. We have to find our own thing. They found their own thing. So let's adapt to what we like. You have an excellent new network here. Yeah. Yes. I feel like I want to go have tea tea or well, <laughs> shall we do spa Champagne. <laughs> or you know whatever yeah, what I'm trying to say uh, is of course we have maybe to be creative even on that sense mm. you know at least we are already here that's already a big step um, but actually I think women are good at networking as, as long as we can get together somehow but in mi my business we're envelopes uh, sewage treatment business not many <laughs> women there but <laughs> i mean <laughs> still out in the field with uh, rubber boots on and you can get a really good connection but do you <laughs> <laughs> i'm coming do you think that women are good at networking and 
setting the rules for those networks. I think that's a, a, mm. a burning point. Yeah, you know, it, we don't really. I, I'm from an SLP background, which means I previously have only basically worked with women because there's just a, just a couple of men who are SLPs in Sweden, and. Um, the rules are still not set by those women within those networks. Mm -hmm. The truths are still, we don't do this innovation. Engineers do the in innovation. Mm -hmm. Other people oh, do yeah. the innovation. So we, we get to have our network as long as it's within those boundaries. Is yeah. my take on it. Because uh, no, I, I agree I don't with you, we, we, uh, we are good at networking, I think. But. It's just that I I don't have that problem because um, I think I don't know, but I think just think that it, I have noticed, not that I have a bad relation with men also, but 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 when I get a connection <laughs> with a woman, if there is a company and I have and that company represented by a woman, I get hundred percent more certain that I will get a good connection because that person will understand me much better. Unfortunately, I, I, I'm, I just noticed many times that I, I'm a little bit more fortunate with my success if there is a woman on the other side of the table. Mm. Um, mm. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm afraid I agree with you. Well, I don't have that big experience, but it's sort of... I don't know. I have this problem with men. I love men. <laughs> 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 but 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 I have some <laughs> I have some problem with not only men but with people, and I don't know if maybe if some of you will also feel the same. But if you come with your message, and you know either you are too young and you are kind of cute little girl, or you are scary, you are a powerful woman, you are a strong woman, you have your own will, strong will. And women don't often. I have the feeling, maybe I'm totally wrong, that women that are, are from the other side, they, they will be okay with whatever you are. Yeah. They don't put you in the little girl c category or she's creepy. Uh, but some men, some... Okay, now I, we are generalizing. I understand yeah. what you mean. Some, exactly. I have a problem with that generalization too. <laughs> yeah, I have a problem with generalizations. <laughs> I mean, I know wonderful men that are middle-aged and fantastic and pepping entrepreneurship and all that. There are many good examples. But there are also some sad examples and in all relations, you know, it's not seldom and it's not only me saying, Katrine writes that stuff in her other books and the other, the other um, invisible woman uh, writer, um, Carolina Perez, I think, wasn't yeah. it? Her books also state this, so it's not only me. It's not uh, rare that you fall into the little girl, cutie, okay, mm. but don't are not respected for that or the scary. No, yeah. scary. I think so too, actually. So I agree. Mm. But it may also happen in female networks that mm. older individuals keep younger individuals, hold them back mm. because we don't uh, abide by the rules. Exactly. The rules not set by them. The though. queen bees. Yes, they don't but the like rules aren't set by them. Bees. They're, they're set by other people and they've had to abide with them so for so long. They've had to live under those rules they for so long. They became half men, actually. Well, maybe not half men, <laughs> but but it, it it's a part of their culture and it's a part of the, a, a work culture, for example, in a workplace. So um, I think also... It, comes back to the Swedish jantelag a little bit, which is basically, who do you think you are? Yeah, You know better than something. anybody else. Yeah. And why should we change the rules for you? Mm. Um, so there is problems within those groups as well. And if I may fill in, innovation is all about breaking rules and bringing new ideas. So there we have a paradox, right? So, so uh, yeah, and it's a thing we have to handle. So we cannot be too scared of not fitting in because it's the non-fitting in that's pushing you into finding a new solution. Mm. And speaking of fi fitting in, we're only, I think, p speaking of binary people now. No, they uh, can be like, tertiary, uh, fourth year. Women and men, but we're... Mm. How about people who are gender fluid or mm. uh, trans trans people. What about ethnicities, you know? Being short and dark haired, not long, tall and blonde. 
you know. Yeah. <laughs> to me, I mean, it has actually been a bigger problem coming with a soft innovation from the social sciences than being a female. It could be that I have started the company together with three male colleagues, but I don't think so. But I think if we want to broaden our view of what an innovation is, we also need to change the support system, the innovation system as such. And I am so happy with the support we have had from uh, Lund University. But still, on my wish list is uh, a broader variety among those who work with supporting innovation. More females, more women, uh, more people with other uh, education backgrounds than engineering and medicine. I think we need a broader variety. It's not that people have been sort of uh, not been supporting, but I've also seen that sometimes the lack, the knowledge, <laughs> of what is a social innovation and if we don't work with tech, uh, where do we find the investors? And I think we also need to find a different, how, how can we sort of uh, find new logics uh, when it comes to investments? I think it was Katrine mm, who was yeah. talking about that. Um, I'm looking for uh, sort of new ways of how can we cooperate with the public sector organizations? How can we cooperate with the civil society? I think we need to, again, broaden our views on what is innovation, how can we support it, how can we invest it? Uh, and I think so, for me, it's absolutely a gender thing, but it's, it's much more than that, again. Yeah. 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 I can just add there, um, uh, to make a little bit of uh, advertisement, but for instance, MedTech for Health has done recently a big project. I was involved in, uh, there for inclusive innovation, mm -hmm. and there it was not even only the females; it was all types of norm varying uh, differences that should maybe start being appreciated. And they, they brought up a book, an handbook, trying really to open up and and train train even communication, you know, that we dare saying different things because that raises ideas and pushes innovation forward. So I really am with you that maybe we should open up to other fields because yeah. it's the, that touch that mm. really f makes new ideas be born. But I also... I, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. I, I, it hurts me to say, but we're actually heading towards the end here. Oh. I, I could sit here for hours and bring in the tea. <laughs> but um, we have a couple of questions from the audience uh, that I would like you to answer before we uh, say goodbye. Uh, and one is, is it possible that women are better entrepreneurs and doctors due to the very nature of women to be more kind and polite and have more patience with clients than men. Yeah, well, I... You're the doctor. <laughs> well, you're the entrepreneur. <laughs> well, we, I think everybody is welcome for sure to comment. I can say that it's, it's true, there are many women in the pipeline in, in healthcare, both doctors and nurses and other uh, physiotherapists and what, what not. But if you look, at least in my field, the cardiology, we are like 30% women uh, in, in Sweden. Um, so we are not many. I hope more people are coming, but, but it's still very skewed. Uh, and there we go back again to the same discussion, the society, the pressures, why do me, women don't dare to become cardiologists? Is it too stressy? Is it, is this, yeah, you have too many on calls, you can't be with your babies, you know, all this. So it's, it's very complex. I, I see lots of male doctors being super kind and super polite and super patient. It's, I think it's an individual thing, of yes, course. So There's yeah. everything, everybody, all sorts of variations, uh, of course. But what I think is, I would like to see more women daring, not only to continue being kind and polite, but daring to go and take the time to create new ideas and innovate and learn to be entrepreneurs and asking for help for the, the networks that exist. 
I think it's again, we don't really dare and we don't have free time. Healthcare is extremely pressed at the moment by product production and uh, beds and lack of beds, lack of patients, lack of <gasps> we <gasps> are in this wheel. And that wheel of the mice <laughs> uh, kills creativi creativity and new ideas. So I, I could dream that there would be both men and women that have the time also to get new ideas and dare to go for this innovation trip that we, you, we are going through. I don't know if it helped. Some final words. Yeah, I would like to just comment on the very nature of women to be more kind and polite. <laughs> Please um, do. Yeah, I think it's not an innate ability. Kindness and politeness, again, I think is learnt and needs practice. Mm. And yes, I think women have more practice in that in that area of necessity mm. uh, because of the way we as a group are brought up, for example, mm. and uh, how we are learned, how we are taught early on to cater to the needs of others. But that's something that we are taught, not something that we are born with. And empathy is something that every, everybody is born with to different degrees. Mm. But men does not have less empathy than women do. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here and talking to me. Uh, it has been very nice uh, to hear about your journeys. Uh, and welcome. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like standing here. Yeah. Let's go there. Right. Should we stand? Or? Good. Please you stay. Can, can we you stand? Can, or? No, you can sit if you want to. <laughs> But we were really, really want to thank you all for being here, the audience and you at home. and. You speakers, it's been really interesting discussions, I think. And I just want to ask a last question. As we work at LU Innovation, how would you, what is your recommendation to us to get more women in research with the ideas to pursue them uh, for an innovative journey? What do you think we could do to improve this? Oh, take care of them like you took <laughs> care of me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, you that was not the official <laughs> answer. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you work with PhD students or students in All general. All the researchers. Yeah, yes. I think it needs more uh, entrepreneurship on the schedule. Okay. Actually, training. <laughs> training. Yeah. Mm? Yeah, thoughts? I think early training in mm. the PhD program is, is great, uh, and perhaps even earlier than that. But also, as I said, uh, I mean, you're great people, <laughs> but an even more mixed background, more That's diversity yeah. among you. I would be, I mean, then I think you would be able to attract even more diversity among the research mm. ideas, mm. actually. Mm. Um, so, but it's not about scaling down or reducing it's about adding people more people to more people innovation. more resources. more, more <laughs> and more resources. diversity among you as a group i think um, i think also specifically reaching out to non-cis males mm. uh, just to anyone who is not a cis male mm. and helping them uh, giving them giving them the tools to ask the questions that we have not even dreamt of yet mm. and help them give them those tools I think at an early age, maybe even pref before a PhD program or maybe even as young as gymnasiet, mm. we need to come out and give them the tools to ask the questions that we don't know can be asked yet. Exactly. Non-cis males. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I like the idea <laughs> of non-cis males or... or why not even putting the finger deep in the wound and saying, Well, making networking for women, sessions of information for women, mm. um, maybe for the university on the PhD level or uh, even on the um, undergraduate level, mm. for instance, in medical students, um, make them know that you exist. Mm. You know, students sometimes see things in the wards that we have been there for ages. We don't see it anymore. We think this is life. But they see maybe a gadget that's not working. They yeah. see something that is a potential innovation. So maybe start the education uh, even there. Mm. Great. We have a lot to do then, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for all the good advices. We um, have to bring it home. Yes. Yes. Put it to work. Um, and um, 
Yeah, and thanks for all the nice uh, kind words about uh, our organization. Uh, it makes me proud of our colleagues. Uh, and um, for the rest of you, please, if you have an idea or want to see what we can help you with at Elo Innovation, don't hesitate to reach out. We are um, always there for you. So uh, now, a uh, big thank you for, um, big thank you to Joanna, uh, big thank you to, I don't know if Katrin is still watching, but if you are, thanks. Uh, thank you to the panel, uh, great, what are innovators, entrepreneurs, scientists, slash, slash, <laughs> slash. All the hats on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, for you here in the physical audience, uh, please stay for a chat. You can mingle with uh, us and the panel. And uh, for you who are uh, online, uh, thanks a lot for joining. And um, that was it yeah. for today. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>